Hello, I'm Sally Roth and I'm a partner and head of health and safety at DAC Beechcroft. We provide advice and representation to organisations in relation to people, product and environmental risk. We believe in finding solutions for organisations to enable them to go about their business, knowing that their people are safe and they are doing things compliantly. We only, one second. Ah, yes, we've only got half an hour or so today. So this is very much a whistle stop tour of the legal implications uh, for the new working environment in this new age of living with COVID. If you have any questions, please do use the chat function. And if we have time at the end, I will answer the questions in this session. And if we don't have time, um, I'll respond to you all individually. So I'm just going to very quickly go through what I'm going to cover today. So I'll look at the current COVID position. We'll look very quickly at employers' duties, then implications, uh, both criminal action and civil claims, and then some practical steps to take. So on the 21st of February, the government in England published its roadmap, as you all know, for the route out of lockdown and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have got their own timetables. The four step plan in England started with some restrictions being lifted from the 8th of March. And as more restrictions are lifted, this inevitably means a return to work for many. And as you know, it's hoped that before the 19th of July, the government or around not before the 19th of July, I should say the government hopes to be in a position to remove all legal limits on social contact. And I think you'll have seen the intention from the new health minister, Savage Javid, which is really to bring that forward as much as possible. Before that, there was an intention, certainly intention of government to review the guidance that's in place for organisations, because what's on the tip of everybody's tongue is what does that mean? What does the lifting of all social restrictions and social contact mean for measures that have been put in place over the last 12 months to keep people safe? So that government is intending to implement uh, a scientific review, and that will be a scientific review of social distancing and other long term measures that have been put in place to cut transmission of the disease. It's really going to look at decisions on timing and circumstances in which the rule of one metre plus wearing of face coverings and other measures should be lifted. And it also should inform the guidance on working from home, which at the moment is still intended to continue wherever possible. Then very briefly, I want to quickly look at employers' duties, because as the country opens up and businesses open their doors, increasing numbers of people are returning to work and receiving visitors. And therefore, we need to remind ourselves of the duties. So there's the duty that is in place in relation to your employees, which is um, the duty to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the health and safety of employees whilst at work. And then there's a corresponding duty for, um, for non-employees where your organisation is affecting people affected by your undertaking and that you're required to do all that's reasonably practicable to ensure their safety. And that's always a balance of cost, time and trouble. Um, and you'll be very, very familiar with the duties which there are in place in relation to organisations. Um, number of regulations which employers are required to comply with in order to keep people safe at work or their visitors safe. Um, and those are set out on the slide and I just don't have time to go through those today, but it's really around, as you would expect, assessing the risk, controlling the risk, monitoring and reviewing it, and then feeding that back into the original assessment and making changes wherever appropriate. Um, so, in relation to particularly mitigation of COVID risks when people are in work, etc., there's absolute wealth of guidance. 
And if organisations follow the guidance, there's a real opportunity to reduce the risk of criminal enforcement action. So where does that guidance come from? Well, there's loads of government, uh, government guidance on the Government UK website, Public Health England, the Health and Safety Executive and other regulators. Um, a number of my clients have said to me, well, what if we don't want to follow the guidance? Well, it is guidance and not law, but as long as you've got equally effective measures in place, you're probably OK. But as I said, if you follow the guidance, you really do reduce the risk of, um, of any enforcement action. One of the most important things I want to say and remind people of is about keeping up to date. Um, I am in a uh, position at the moment of advising a significant facilities client who um, whose employees didn't follow the guidance and it's not just a question of making sure that guidance is available to your employees it's really about making sure that they fully understand and implement that guidance and that's really really tricky when guidance is changing regularly and that has certainly been positioned throughout the pandemic. So it's really important to keep that guidance up to date, but make sure that that guidance is fully understood and um, implemented by your employees. So really go that extra mile to make sure that you're checking understanding and that they're actually implementing what that it looks like. Now, the next slide really is a, a little diagram of the various risks, which you're all very familiar with, I'm sure, in relation to control measures and issues. Um, as man, many of you probably already had to grapple with a number of these issues when we came out of the first lockdown. Um, but for me, I'm just going to pick out one particular area given, given time constraints today. And I'm going to look at the vaccine because I think that's where I'm certainly seeing lots and lots of questions. As um, the COVID vaccine is being rolled out, many employees, uh, employers rather, are looking for their employees to be vaccinated to enable them to return to the workplace. And in doing so, a number of employers are asking us whether or not they can mandate that their workforce receives COVID-19 vaccinations. It's really not uncommon, it's really not very common in the UK or in the EU for contracts of employment to include an express right for the employer to compel its employees to have a vaccination. But it might be reasonable uh, to give a reasonable management instruction to employees to receive the vaccine in certain, but probably fairly rare circumstances. Uh, and the, those sorts of circumstances might be where someone is required to travel overseas or where interactions with, with, with the public are at sick and therefore there's significant risk of exposure to COVID-19. For example, in the health and social care sector, and we've certainly seen that debate um, being played out in the media as to whether or not care home assistants and people working within care homes should be compulsory required to uh, receive the vaccine. But, but it's not quite as straightforward as that as we've already seen in the media. The rights of the employees need to be balanced against the reasons for the instruction. And in considering whether an instruction mandating a vaccination should be given, employers are likely to have to look at the protection of the individual employee and their employees' um, colleagues, and in some circumstances, vulnerable people with whom the employee interacts. The instruction to get the vaccine will need to be proportionate to the risks and will need to be fully risk assessed and in many cases will need to be consulted upon with unions or uh, workforce representatives and the staff themselves. So if any employer wished to mandate that its um, workforce is vaccinated, it would need to assess the benefits and risks of vaccination and have in place a targeted approach with the opt-out arrangements and a defined rollout process. And the introduction of a policy of mandatory vaccination may discriminate against a number of groups of people. And we've all seen those groups of people who are being played out in the press. So employers could, 
who seek to mandate vaccination or testing could face claims for damages for discrimination. And therefore, care needs to be taken if employers consider disciplining or dismissing employees for refusing vaccination. Dismissing an employee for refusing to attend work or not paying them for non-attendance will be at risk of, um, the, on the basis that they will be at risk of contracting COVID-19 could may result in a successful claim for damages if the employee is found to have had a reasonable belief that attending work would have put them in serious or imminent danger. If employers retain data on an employee who have received the COVID-19 vaccination, the data is a special category um, of data for the purposes of GDPR and the Data Protection Act and should be treated securely and confidentially and deleted when no longer required. Data should only be processed lawfully and a data impact assessment may be required. So it's not clear whether or not the use of the vaccination still prevents the transmission of COVID-19 and there's lots of um, conflicting scientific evidence in relation to that. And the duration of immunity offered isn't known as well. So the vaccine should not within the works for shouldn't be relied upon as a singular control measure in my view in risk assessments particularly where some of the workforce have not had the opportunity to be, to be vaccinated or the vaccination of employees is not compulsory. Employers should ensure that COVID secure measures other than vaccination are in place to protect the workforce and should undertake individual risk assessments in relation to employees at greater risk of COVID-19. So what about other risks? So as we return to work, we're often going to be seeing, um, going forward, hybrid working. So one has to look at working from home as continuing duty to ensure that working from home, people are safe whilst working from home. That will involve a review of displaying screen equipment um, control measures, making sure that they are the, the, the equipment provided is fit for purpose and people are not being exposed to musculoskeletal disorders. We're also hearing a lot of it, uh, concerns, and I know that you've got other sessions today in relation to people's well-being and stress at work. Um, also something that needs to be kept under review. There's going to be a new way of being able to, in, in new, a need for a new way of interacting interacting with our people, requiring different skills of managers and those who interact with them. And those, all those things need to be fed into risk assessments around working from home. The hybrid model also brings with it potentially other legal risks. So if someone is working from home two days a week and then working in the office three days a week or in a factory three days a week, What's the position in relation to the duty of care whilst they're traveling? Where is their workplace? There is potentially um, the fact that their workplace is now at home. So whilst they are traveling to work, that is part of their working day. Whereas previously commuter time wasn't an area where the duty of care um, extended for employers. But there is a risk that going forward that that duty extends into that workplace travel. So, you know, what is the position about giving people advice in relation to their travel to work? So uh, issues around social distancing, um, methods of traveling, taking care in relation to traveling from work so as not to be exposed to COVID-19, but also in relation to other workplace transport risks. And we just don't know what the position is in relation to that yet. So there's a need to be aware of it and certainly a moral duty, I think, to make sure that people have sufficient education and knowledge to be able to manage those risks. Right at the early days of the pandemic, we were also seeing over-reporting in relation to Riddle. Um, employees were employers were reporting incidents to the HSC out of the abundance of caution, and this resulted in many cases of unwanted attention from the health and safety executive, as well as the health and safety executive being um, overwhelmed. 
there is a need to report where there's a dangerous occurrence or disease and it's work related or where the death is also work related. Given that COVID infections are, however, widespread within the community, it doesn't automatically follow that just because someone is working when they developed COVID, that it was required in the workplace. Accordingly, it is really a matter of whether or not there's reasonable evidence that, um, that it was contracted within the workplace. And that's going to be a case by case decision. Uh, and there's an awful lot of considerations that could be taken into account either way. And certainly that's uh, a subject for another day and something that I can cover off. But when you do make those decisions, the important thing is to make sure that you record that decision making process so that if you are challenged by the health and safety executive later, that you can produce that consideration and that should certainly protect you from unwanted um, enforcement action. For me, the most important, there's also when there's a return to workplace, it's really important to look at other risks that within the workplace, not just COVID-19, because other risks are going to be um, particularly prevalent. Things like Legionella, if a workplace has been closed down for a period of time, really look at your Legionella risk assessment, make sure that those Legionella risks have been appropriately scrutinised, that your risk assessment is up to date, control measures are in place. Look at quit equipment as well around statutory inspections. They may have been overlooked or not been possible to be carried out during the pandemic. So again, there's a need to look at those. For me, however, the most important piece is really around training and competency. In some cases, people will not have been um, in the workplace for up to 15 months. So that really means that uh, it will, uh, some of the training that they have received, the confidence that they have in interacting with people and carrying out their job may well have diminished over that period. So training um, and checking competency of people is right up there, very, very important to make sure that those are all being appropriately addressed. So what if you do, um, have issues in relation to compliance? Um, what if the health and safety executive is on your tail? Well, that is likely to result in an investigation. That investigation is likely to be very time consuming and costly um, in terms of management and other time, particularly, as well as potentially legal costs. The health and safety executive um, can serve notices of contravention, they can also recover their costs for carrying out those investigations that they carried out by way of fees for intervention. They can impose um, uh, enforcement notices, particularly improvement notices requiring improvements to be carried out over a period of time, or stop you working completely by serving prohibition notices until acts are done and, and measures are put in place. At the worst end of the case, obviously, there's a potential for prosecution and significant fines. For me, as well, there's a significant issue of reputational risk, and lots of organisations probably see this as being one of the greatest areas of risk for them, because that risks um, loss of public confidence, employee confidence, and third party confidence. And that's really been played out in a number of scenarios. And you may well be familiar with the outbreak of COVID at the DVLA at their Swansea office in December, 2020, when it was confirmed that there were 560 employees infected with the virus. That outbreak had a huge impact on employee confidence. Um, 6,000 strong workforce felt scared to go into work and speak up against unhygienic conditions and lack of social distancing. And um, it was the level of confidence was such that a number of um, workers voted for industrial action. It was also pretty uncomfortable and reputationally damaging the organisation when the CEO and HR director were required to give evidence to the Transport Committee on the outbreak of COVID at the end of January. And anyone uh, as sad as I am who watched the coverage of that questioning by MPs couldn't fail to squirm and feel very uncomfortable. I wanted to touch on, um, touch on civil claims as well. Um, just cover those off very quickly as well. 
um, because for those who let allege that they have contracted COVID as a result of negligent exposure in the workplace, there are two potential avenues of claims, primary claims from those themselves who contracted or alleged to have contracted COVID in the workplace, and also um, secondary claims from those members of their family or friends who alleged that having been in contact with them, they too have gone on to develop the same condition. I'm going to flick over this slide very, very quickly, because as you'll see, the employer's duties are analogous to and similar to those for criminal. Um, unlike criminal cases, the key element for civil claims is whether negligence or breach of duty has caused injury. So what evidence is there that the employee has suffered from COVID-19 and what evidence is there that it's been contracted whilst in work. In addition, there's a question of legal causation. So there are a number of potential tests to establish legal causation. And at the moment, we've just got absolutely no idea as to how those, uh, which route is going to be taken by the courts in relation to legal causation. So is it going to be but for exposure to um, COVID-19 virus in the workplace, the individual has developed it? Or is it going to be a question of um, a material, the exposure in the workplace has, um, is a material contributor to the development of the condition? Or, for, or, or perhaps is it going to be a question of whether or not you can't specify the source, but because perhaps because there are multiple causes, but exposure in work has increased that risk. Currently, we just don't know what test, but we will be certainly as lawyers, as civil lawyers, we'll be arguing that the but for test ought to apply. But at the moment, it's not known which avenue the courts are going to take in relation to causation. Do however want to look at um, practical steps and evidence because it's really important that following a suspected outbreak of COVID-19 in the workplace that you collect evidence immediately as memories fade um, and information disappears quickly and your ability to be able to defend these cases depends upon the quality of your evidence. So collect it as soon as possible, look for gaps, imagine that before you, that you're in, in front of a court, so what story are you going to tell the court about your measures and the procedures that you've got in place to um, keep people safe? What was in place? And on the slide, I've set out a number of considerations. So was there a risk assessment in place? Were there safe systems of work? When and how often was that risk assessment updated? And we need to make sure that we collect the previous versions of those risk assessment, really unusually because of the changing nature of the guidance, et cetera, we're gonna have various versions. So keeping version control is going to be really, really important and keeping those ver previous versions important. How was that risk assessment communicated to employees? Was there a consideration of individual risk? Was there training? What's the evidence of that training? Were concerns raised by employees? Who are the potential witnesses? All of these things need to be gathered when you have a pot potential outbreak of COVID or someone reporting COVID. What about health questionnaires? Were people exposed outside the workplace? You know, you might want to look at social media searches potentially. Were there other sources of the virus? All of these things really need to be gathered at the earliest stage to give you the best opportunity to defend against these cases. So what other practical steps should employers take? For me, really, it, currently at the moment, just before we get to um, uh, the removal of these social contact restrictions, we could, it's time to reflect. Look at your risk assessments and control measures. Do you have an effective crisis plan should the worst happen? Because, you know, it's inevitable. We're already seeing workplaces open, um, retail and um, hospitality open. And as we do so, infection rates are, are increasing. So make sure that you're well planned by having a good crisis management plan in place. 
what lessons have you learned from previous peaks and been able to implement those? Really looking at what went well, what needs improving, what can you do differently? And checking and ensuring that all of those things are being appropriately implemented. And really just finally then in terms of um, advice, when do you need to get advice? When is it, you know, lawyers are expensive. You don't want to involve lawyers on each and every occasion, but it is important to get advice in particular circumstances. So if there is a need to complete a riddle or you're thinking about riddle, really it's a great idea to get a lawyer involved at that stage. I'm more than happy to look at people's riddle responses, making sure that the, the way in which the information is being presented is factual, is not leading you into difficulties. When there's regulator involvement in terms of investigations, absolutely get a lawyer involved. Um, they don't necessarily have to have the day-to-day -day contact with the regulator, but giving you advice in the background is absolutely um, really useful, really useful, um, because you're going to be able to maintain control. They'll be able to tell you about what the next steps that the regulator is taking, what the regulator is looking for, and help you manage the way in which information is given to them. You've got a COVID cluster. Again, important to get lawyers involved because we, again, we can help with gathering of the evidence that you may need to either defend a criminal or civil um, proceedings. So uh, it's a really good set to have us that second pair of eyes also can help with the investigation report. And as I say, control of these things is absolutely key, as is the way in which information is presented. One thing you don't want to do is take an early view. It's best to be able to step back, consider all of the uh, evidence that you've got, and then decide on the appropriate way forward. Finally, I think, as, as, as I haven't mentioned so far, is really about making sure that if you do have a COVID situation, that you manage appropriately communications, whether that's with the press, with your employees or third parties, because by keeping that communication going, you're going to reduce the risk of reputational damage. I hope that has been a helpful um, overview I'm very, very conscious that it's been very much a whistle-stop tour. We've touched on so many areas this morning, um, but I'm able to deal with those. If you've got any questions, I think I'm completely out of time, so I'm not going to be able to answer those this morning, but I will come back to you individually. Thank you for your time and for listening to me. Bye.